So our invitation is just um, just try and notice, you know, try and be aware of, try and notice that part of your being, which is different from the part of your being that's trying to get somewhere else. What's going to happen next? It can be, what do I need to know? It can be, where is this session going to get me to? It can be, what next piece of knowledge is going to set me free from suffering? So the invitation is to try and find yourself in this moment. And of course, uh, the paradox is, you know, as they say in Zen, to find yourself, you need to forget yourself. And so in this way, as a uh, Buddha said, or it's said in Buddhism, it's said that someone asked the Buddha what he got from meditating, and he said, I didn't get anything. But what I lost was anxiety, fear, concern about death so it was more you know as yoda says first unlearn before you learn so meditation is more of a of a stripping away of falsehood falsehood you know of course christ says i am the way i am truth so we could say that what we're doing is not learning the truth but stripping away untruth and so then what they say in india is truth is uh, something which is changeless so truth is not opinion <laughs> if we think truth is uh, an opinion then we tend to want to kill the people <laughs> verbally psychologically or even physically who have a different version of truth <laughs> I'm going to tr I'm going to call truth Yahweh. We're going to we're going to call truth Allah. Let's kill each other. <laughs> Cuz you I'm so offended by the words you've given to truth that I need to exterminate you now. <laughs> so, crazy. So it's better to find a truth that, as Lao Tzu opens his disclaimer at the beginning of the Tao and the Tao Te Ching first line. I call it the Tao, but that's not what it's called. Because <laughs> every time I try and name it, I limit it. So in this moment, what is nameless? What is not trying to grasp at something? What's not trying to figure anything out? You know, rest in that. So now you've arrived. Now you've discovered the truth, which was already there. And 
sometimes the peace will arise. It'll just be there. You know, the peace that is beyond understanding. In, in other words, not worth labeling, not worth conceptualizing, not worth grasping. The, the what isness, you know, it's already there. But this truth is so simple, you know, Lao Tzu says, you know, the Tao is so simple. Tao means the way. And that's why he says no one can grasp it. Then at some point... The mind will come back and go, it's it's fa favorite mantra. You know, the soul, the first word of the mantra of the, of the soul is Om. <laughs> and the first mantra, the word of the mantra of the, the mind is but. <laughs> What about? <laughs> so what do you do with this mind? So you might as well give it something to do. So different traditions, you know, the Buddhists say, well, let's give it the breath. Let's convince it that if it watches the breath, it's going to get somewhere. So mind goes, hey, <laughs> if I watch the breath for an hour, I'll get somewhere. And so it shuts up for an hour, if you're lucky. <laughs> or we give it a prayer or a mantra, you know, keep it busy. So we sit with the stillness or the breath or the mantra. And we enter the two stages, two aspects of what's called enlightenment. The first stage is there's nothing to become. The second stage is a paradox. When you realize there's nothing to become, you start to become something <laughs> that any chance of trying to become something gets in the way of. And so when the Sufis call this, they say, this is polishing the mirror of the heart. Of course, if you're polishing, the reflection just slowly becomes clearer. Slowly over your whole lifetime. So there's this spaciousness, deep surrender.
for every moment. We're cleaning the mirror of the heart to reflect the light or the peace or the love that slowly embodies itself in the cells of our being. And so but slowly all the neurosis that's held in the body, the fear, the anxiety, it just becomes transmuted by this light. Little by little, as if these traumas are released, the heaviness in our energy body cleansed. And all we need to do is come back to the process of cleaning, cleansing, opening, and just surrendering into that process. So effortless. Wonderful, okay. So. So then the question is, you know, what do you mean by authentic? And who are you? Are you the same person all day long? I'm not. <laughs> the person I am in the morning can be person is different in the afternoon. Or, you know, the person I am yesterday, the person I am today is different. So which of those am I meant to be? And then am I meant to just say every single thought that comes into my mind, you know, which is always changing my opinions? And so I was saying for, you know, there's a time, you know, to speak your mind, all that kind of stuff. But from the work I offer, the authenticity is, you know, who am I? <laughs> So I believe that true authenticity, authenticity is when we're being our soul. But then we can't make that up. We can't just, I know, I'm going to be my soul today. It just kind of starts to show up little by little. And so, you know, what we're learning to do is just little by little we're letting go of who we're not. You know, Christ calls us being born of the flesh. And little by little, we're being who we are, naturally, no effort. And then Christ says, you know, that we know when we're moving into authenticity, when we become the image and likeness of love, we're more compassionate. And maybe one day we even get to a point where we only feel love for people trying to persecute us. I'm not there yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> but maybe one day. <laughs> there's, a, there's a beautiful story in India that I heard and um, the essence of the story is that it's kind of what you're saying, that it's attachments, that, you know, being attached to something which causes suffering. 
And there's a beautiful book, I think it's by, it's one of the ones I've mentioned before by a, gay, a guy called Sir Swami Rama. And um, he he's living as a, an ascetic. It means like he's, he's given up, you know, the world. And then he's in the Himalayas. And he's watching two, um, two aesthetics who've given up the world, you know. And um, he watches them come back. They, they own nothing, literally nothing, you know, and they just beg. And I think that, that a lot of the sadhus, they call them, and even naked in the Himalayas, they literally have nothing, you know. And they sit down to meditate. And um, they start arguing over a piece of grass. <laughs> There's a lump of grass that's more comfortable. And so they end up ha having a fist fight. <laughs> Who's going to meditate on the lump of grass, you know, the most comfortable meditation spot. And this, uh, there's a story around that in the, uh, I heard it's a wisdom story in India. And so there's a story of a, a family with a house and a car. And uh, one of the members of that family is seen as a spiritual teacher to the local community. And so um, then there's another spiritual teacher that lives in the village or the city or wherever it is. And he has all he has is a possession, a, like a bowl. And he, he drinks out the bowl, he out, eats out the bowl, and he collects arms, you know, in the bowl. And so there's a student who wants to become, you know, a spiritual seeker in that village. And so he's trying to figure out which of these two teachers to follow. You know, there's the guy with a bowl and there's a guy with a house, car and family. And he thinks, OK, I'll try and figure out which who has the least attachments, because it seems to be the guy with just the bowl. And so he goes to the guy that owns the house and says, can I borrow your car? Because I need to go to the next village and see my family. And the guy goes, yeah, sure. Here's the keys, you know, help yourself. Just bring it back when you need to. And so then he goes, sees his family and comes back. And as he arrives back on this driveway, he notices the other teacher is sat with the bowl waiting for money, you know, and in front of the house, just sat on the pavement. And he thinks the, the guy, the, the student in the car thinks, I'm so thirsty. Maybe I could just go and get his bowl and get some water. So he goes to this guy sat on the streets and says, um, can I just use your bowl? I'm thirsty and I need some water. And the guy says, no. He says, I can't give you this bowl because if someone walks past with money, what am I going to do? I'm not going to have money for the day. And so the story is that he realizes that the guy with the bowl is attached and the guy with the house is, has no attachment or little or no attachment. So the, I think the story when I heard that it points to, I think it's right. I think also it gets quite hard when you have things, I, you know, not that I'm a millionaire, but then there's a, there can be a fear of losing those things that can be, a, which I think was what Christ, Christ was try, saying it's harder, you know, for a rich man to get through the eye of a needle or the, than a camel or something like that. You know? And so I think there's a, there's a beautiful thing when we just, my, my teacher in India said, money is like shoes. He said, just find the size that fits, you know? And so that might be different for different people, but I do agree, mate, that um, I think having some money and being free of debt relieves the stress in the body. I do, I do experience that. But then there's been times most of my life when I had no money and, um, has struggled to pay the bills every single month, you know, for a long, long time. And I, I don't know if I'm, I'm that much happier now that I can do that, which is weird, you know, because I, I question that. There's certainly a level of tension that's gone, you know, a level of worry about, God, how am I going to pay my rent? You know, going to the, the, the Isle of Asda that has the whoop aisle, you know, the reduced things. And now I can go and buy on a, you know, like uh, the extra special cheese. Oh, God, I feel so rich, you know? So, yeah, I really reflect on that. Man. Yeah, it certainly seems to be the case that there is a, a different type of happiness that is.
you know, in relation to these kind of practices. You know, when I work one to one with people, we can do deeper dives on that because we find out what the stories are in the fight and flight mechanism, why it's there. So there's, but like it's harder in a in a group situation. But let me tell you how I work with anxiety in my body, and in case it's any use to you, you know, it, I a lot of feelings are unconscious. So a feeling uh, when it's unconscious, it is pure data. Uh, so it tends to be feeling without thought. And so that means there's something in the unconscious mind that's processing, whereas thought tends to be subconscious. So we can kind of be aware of thought, but feeling is unconscious, usually more body based. And so it, it can be, you know, all kinds of stuff, uh, you know. So the way it, I tend to be with my um, anything in my life, my, my path is a path of love. So. The, the, the way I would tend to walk, work with it is I'd notice where it was in my body. You know, I'd be with it like I was looking after a child that was upset. And then I'd just sit with it for as how many days as it took. <laughs> I'd just sit, not just sit with it nonstop for those, those days. What I mean is bringing my awareness to it and just, ah, there it is in my body. I can feel into it, maybe visualize it. And now... I, I'm just holding it with gentleness and compassion, listening to anything it's seeing, seeing if it's bringing up any childhood memories and just allowing it to process. And then the, you know, generally when something is surfacing in the, the, the body like that, I mean, weirdly enough, it doesn't feel like it at the time, but it's actually usually a good thing. Because what that is, it's something within the that's been trapped and suppressed in the unconscious mind that's ready to heal. It's ready to present itself to consciousness. There's a maybe a wisdom inside the body that says, okay, we're ready to release this now. This person is either mature enough in their healing journey or has a technique or a support group. So let's bring it into the consciousness so it can be released from the nervous system in some unique way. And so really my my uh it, 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 this is a hard word because it 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 creates more questions but what i'm doing is I, as i'm offering it to love or to god or whatever you want to call it okay i open this to you now and sometimes you know that might stay around for a few days and that's okay too because there might be some deep processing happening i had three days of intense anxiety over christmas after a conversation with a family member that brought up some intense childhood stuff, but I knew it was okay. And then I went through three days of literally my body shaking. And at the end of those three days, it left and I was a different person. And the peace was deeper. The maturity was deeper. The, the being able to speak my truth, which I hadn't done in a childhood situation was there, which wasn't before. So if we can learn how to process these stuff, be with it, compassion, awareness. That, that's the process for me anyway. Yeah. Is that helpful at all? Sometimes yeah. life conspires in that way. Like sometimes it's inner and outer. And the, the random thing on the outside, in my experience, sometimes is part of the healing process. It, like, it makes me face things which seem intense like as you say neighbor problem family problem you've got this on the inside you've got this on the outside and it's all just going crazy and sometimes it's you know sometimes for me it's like the storm comes and we're in a little sailing yacht going across the ocean and all we can do is bring in the sail and go go below deck fasten everything down get spun in the waves a few times but but at the same time all we have is the knowing that the storm doesn't last and that's that's the knowing you know so that's how it's been for me sometimes hmm. yeah i i i i understand that man because i i've experienced i would say i've had a an experience of that in my life i used to go to hypnotherapists and it was like i just couldn't feel and it was like, man, what's wrong with me? Everyone's having these big breakthroughs. But then through meditation, through Tai Chi, 
I think my consciousness just felt safer and safer to start to feel. So little by little, you know, that the, the feelings started to open and, and release. So I think, um, so an answer to your question about maybe we're a family member, then um, they're, they're on their journey. And so all we can offer is, I believe, our presence and our compassion. Um, but if it's in relationship to us, you know, we just we just decide we want to heal and then the law of attraction we can call it that um, we just start to call in the right healers right situations right experiences that start to either crack us open or give us those opportunities like you you know described in the qigong and so just like i say the most insp the most powerful spiritual practice on earth is the desire to heal you know that's the most important one because if that's there strong enough We'll just draw in what we need to be able to achieve that, the desire to awaken. Yeah, so I've been rich and poor. Once you lose your health, you become just you. You don't need to find something, just be in peace. It's a tough one to swallow that for me, isn't it? I guess you're the same, Trisha. Like sometimes when I've been at the most sick, I've been the most peaceful. Very weird. And then I, but I still don't want to get sick. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I hate suffering, you know. And sometimes, yeah. you know, the deepest healings come from, you know, the suffering. That Sue, you know, he says, you know, don't chase, he said, he almost discourages chasing. I, I'm not there yet. He says, this, he discouraged chasing happiness and success. He says, you know, what do you learn most from? Do you really learn from loads of success or do you learn more from failure? So I think it has to be a balance, you know. One of the things I've really had to learn on my path that is that I'm worthy of love. And so I didn't used to think I was, so I kept myself in bad situations because it's like, <laughs> maybe I deserve this, maybe I'll learn from this. It's the kind of martyr thing. And I, I, I just stayed in a lot of bad situations for longer than I needed to. Yeah. Like I, 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 I've been through so much of this in my life, like, like there's annoying noise and I just think, well, I'll meditate through this and I just have a, a shit meditation. <laughs> like, why did I do that? Why didn't I just go a walk around the park and feel good? <laughs> so I, my, my, my personal preference after being a martyr is it just sucks why why am i putting myself through suffering you know i i just it doesn't work for me i've just put myself in very dark situations dark places and i can't see that any good came from it um i remember i lived in a house once and i actually had mild ptsd when i leave le left this house because the the bullying and the intimidation of the neighbors and I stayed there because it was like, okay, I surrender. And two years in, I'm listening to Abraham Hicks and I've been praying, I've been singing and everything to try and get out of the situation and nothing. And just feeling lousy, you know, really vandalism every day, intimidation, violence, etc. And then one day I was listening to the channel Abraham Hicks and she said, um, the highest spiritual practice is just be happy. It's like... God, yeah, okay. And, you know, I'll just be happy. And then I decided to be happy. I decided to not be in the house through the day and just sleep there at night and sleep with the television on. So when there was balls banging off the window at four in the morning, they didn't wake me up. And, and so after a week of that, someone just offered me a better house out of the blue. And it was almost like as I sh allowed myself to feel happy and feel loved and feel important in my own life, it always just opened. It was like, oh, man.
Okay, let's move into some sacred prayer. So, sacred prayer is oh, just my favorite practice, really. Um, so, sacred prayer is where, you know, what I offer as, as a practice, as a meditation is, uh, just to, to hold in your mind an image of the divine. You could imagine light, but also light can be quite um, uh, abstract. So, you know, I often invite you to imagine a being, right? You know, someone who embodies that light, which is the path of devotion. So this can be like a Buddha or Guan Yin or whoever you like, whoever you feel is a, a beautiful embodiment of these higher principles. And the meditation is literally you just either imagine, draw, or perhaps you've seen a statue or an icon that represents that being. And all you're doing is you're holding your mind on that image. And there's nothing more complicated to it than that. And within that imagining, you may also, you know, you, Within your mind, use the mantra, the divine name, so you can gently repeat the name associated with that image in any way you wish. So this is the uh, this is a form of meditation where we are simply focusing on a prayer, or we we could call that a mantra, which is the rec recitation of a divine name. And we're letting our mind rest on that image or word. And some of you may be experiencing peace in your being. Some of you may not be. And both of those things is completely okay. If you like, you're bringing the divine presence to however you are in this moment with compassion to your suffering, to your bliss, to your openness or your closedness. You're letting the divine compassion hold that.
hearts is the true offering on the divine altar where you're offering everything, your pleasure, your pain. You're just bringing it all to love's presence, divine presence. There's a willingness and an openness to be in that presence as you are. Teacher used to say, just keep holding the earthly consciousness and the divine consciousness, or keep holding the world and keeping holding the divine. And he said, just over time, you'll find yourself letting go of the world and holding more tightly to the divine. Okay, so just coming into the closing of the session. So just in reflection, I love uh, Osho's teaching. It's similar to Lao Tzu's around this. And so Osho once said, uh, act as if you're the first one here. And Lao Tzu says, when you're in alignment with Tao, the need for rules and regulations fall away. So you just trust your own way, your own truth, your own Tao. He said when people lose that, 
They turn to books, rules, regulations, shoulds, ought tos. He said that's the beginning of chaos, a chaos that leads to hell. <laughs> so, so beautiful to hang out with you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your night, and um, I guess I'll see you all soon.